Hey, so we're so glad that you're checking out this video and our prayer is that it helps those who are far from God become committed followers of Jesus Christ. However, what we don't want is for this video to be a replacement for church. It can't be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering of believers, being in covenant community with other believers at the local church matters. And what's more is that God designed us to be in community with one another. So we pray that this video serves as a blessing to you, that it helps you, that it encourages you, and even challenges you and brings you closer to Jesus. So again, we're super excited that you're checking out this video and we pray that it's a help to you. Just don't treat this video as a replacement for your church, and I think the Lord will honor that and see your commitment to the local church. Most of you know who I am. Uh, I've been the discipleship pastor here for about two and a half years. We came from overseas. My uh, kind family is brave enough to sit on the front row. They learned that in Latin America, and so uh, they, we haven't told our kids they don't have to sit there yet, and so they're still willing to do that. One of the things that you guys may not know about me is that I am the owner, sometimes proud owner, of a 20-pound jet black mini, snout, supposed to be mini schnauzer from Panama. You should see her up on the screen now. Her name's Ruby. Uh, Ruby is, uh, she is four years old. Uh, she is a handful. And so uh, Ruby is always alert and always on point. And what that means is, is that every leaf that falls from a tree, every squirrel that jumps from one limb to another, every bunny that bounds through our yard, every UPS or Amazon delivery that comes to our house, every person that enters our house is a lethal threat to our family. And she guards us at all points. Our dog is nervous. Our dog is antsy. And it makes her owner, when people come to our house, antsy and nervous as to what my dog's going to do whenever we have a guest over. And uh, so Ruby is, is a sweet puppy. I talked to you about her because that sweet, antsy, nervous puppy, there's a word that we can say in our house that will center her. It's a word that will make her sit down it's a word that will make her lock eyes with me. It's a word that will make her tail move as fast as absolutely possible while still sitting still. That word is B-A-L-L. -L. You don't say that word in my house without Ruby coming to you and sitting and waiting for the action that's about to come at the sight of a ball. At the sound of that word, my dog is ready. You see, all of those other distractions that were around her, squirrels, UPS men, leaves falling, all of those things, they just fade away at the word or the sight of a ball. At the word or the sight of a ball, my sweet dog locks on. She is focused and she has one goal in her whole life. Do you know what that goal is? Pursue the ball. Pursue the ball. Everything else goes away. That's all that she wants in all of the world is a B-A-L-L. -L. What do you want most in the world? What are you pursuing the most? What makes everything in your life fade away so that you're looking and seeking that one thing? We've been working through the book of Mark. If you have been with us, we come to a passage today in Mark chapter 9, verse 42 through 50, um, that's going to challenge us with that question. What is it that we're pursuing? What are we chasing after? What makes everything else fade away. We'll give up anything else to obtain this. Now, this passage is also going to talk a lot about a three-letter word, S-I-N-N. -N. And to a lesser degree, it's going to talk about a four-letter word, H-E-L-L. -L. Those words are not words that we necessarily talk about a lot. You see, it's a, they're not popular topics in our world today. If I were a visiting pastor and I were to choose my own text and come to a room to speak in a room I haven't been in a long time, I probably would choose something a little more encouraging and uplifting than this passage. 
But we're committed to working through this book together, and I don't believe that it's a coincidence that I stand here, and I don't believe it's a coincidence that you sit where you sit today. And so we're going to let this passage say what the passage says. We live in a world where it's inappropriate to tell someone that what they say or what they do is wrong. It's even less appropriate to say to someone that what you're doing is against what God has commanded for you to do. You just don't do that. To say that there are eternal consequences to not obeying what God says, well, that'll make you an extremist. It'll make you radical. It'll make you a fundamentalist. It'll make you a legalist, or it'll make you something worse. What I want to propose to you today is that the most loving thing that Jesus could do the most loving thing that any of your pastors can do, the most loving thing that any brother or sister in Christ can do is to go to a brother or a sister in sin and to call them to step away from their sin and to pursue Jesus just like Ruby pursues a ball, to chase after him with all that you have, with all that's in you. Your sole focus is to follow Jesus, to walk in righteousness. I think that's the most loving thing that we can do, to lovingly plead for someone to step away from the fire and to step into grace. My prayer for you today is that if you walked into this room and you're fighting with a sin in your life, if you walked into this room and you've got a pet sin that you keep in your pocket or that you hide in a closet at home, that when you walk out of this room, that you won't be trapped by that sin anymore and that you'll have victory over it. There's a way to take our passage that we're going to look at today and focus only on sin. There's a way that we can preach it and read it where we beat each other up or we beat ourselves up. But to be honest, I don't think that that's very effective. It's about as, as effective as me saying to you, don't think about a pink elephant. And everybody in the room just thought about a pink elephant. I don't think that what Jesus is calling us to do is not to do something. I think that what he's going to call us to do is to do something, to pursue him, to chase after righteousness. As soon as I mention it all, as soon as I mention it, all you can do is think about what you're not supposed to do. And what I want you to do is to think about what you should do. I believe it's this posture of looking at this passage also aligns with the greater context of what the text has said. If you'll think back to several weeks ago, we were in Mark chapter 8, we read verse 34, and that passage said, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We were challenged that week to ask ourselves really a question. Are we willing to suffer for Christ? Are we willing to suffer? Are we willing to go anywhere that he calls us to go, to do anything that he calls us to do? Are we willing to lay down all of our dreams and our hopes and our plans and take up God's will to follow after him? Are we willing to do that? Committed followers of Christ are willing to suffer for him. And then just a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, we talked about another S, We said that committed followers are willing to serve. Jesus said in that sermon, he said, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last, and he must be servant of all. A committed follower of Christ is someone who's willing to suffer for the Lord's will. A committed follower of Christ is someone who's willing to serve him to follow him, to serve those that are around him, to allow himself to be last and allow others to be first. Today, we're going to ask another question, another question that follows from Jesus' teaching. That question is, are we pursuing righteousness? Are we pursuing righteousness? Dr. Shaddix, if you're watching, I wanted to say, are we seeking righteousness so that we would have a full S's, suffer, serve, and seek, but we're just going to stick with pursue today. 
The main point of our sermon we're going to talk about even before we get to the text. Here is the main point of our sermon. If you're taking notes, write this down. You should see it on the screen. Jesus calls his followers to pursue righteousness by warning of sin's eternal consequences. Jesus calls his followers. He calls you and me. He calls our church to pursue righteousness, to chase after it by warning us of sin and sin's eternal consequences. You'll remember that the last time that we were together, two weeks ago in the book of Mark, that Jesus entered into a house in Capernaum and he sat down. And when he sat down, he sat down in the posture of a rabbi. And he had all of the disciples sitting at his feet. They were like his students, his pupils. And he began to teach them. He taught them about what does it mean to follow after me. He talked to them about what it meant to, he said, and whoever welcomes me does not, whoever welcomes me does not welcome me only, but him who sent me. And then he went on in verse 41, and he shares more positive. He says, if anyone gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, Truly, I tell you, he will never lose his reward. And so Jesus is teaching, and that two weeks ago, we we got all of the positive, calling to the positive. And this week, we get something else. And so if you would, I would ask that you would join me in Mark chapter 9, verses 42 through 50. And I want you to listen to Jesus call you and call me to pursue after righteousness. Mark chapter 9, verses 42, all the way through 50. But whoever causes one of these little ones to believe, who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand, if your hand causes you to fall away, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed then have two hands and go to hell, the unquenchable fire. And if your foot, if your foot causes you to fall away, cut it off. For it's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye, if your eye causes you to fall away, gouge it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt should lose its flavor, how can you season it? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. In case you were wondering, Jesus takes sin seriously. He takes sin seriously, and he believes, no, he promises, that sin has eternal consequences. If we had surveyed everyone as they came in with a question like you would maybe in one of these big shopping centers about cleanliness, and we would have said, today, are you pursuing righteousness or not? My assumption is, is that the vast majority of us would have walked into the room and we would have clicked the yes box. We would have said, yeah, 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 I'm pursuing righteousness. What I believe that Jesus does today is he challenges us with at least three questions that will guide us and be indicators to us of whether we're really pursuing righteousness or not. We're saying that we pursue righteousness, but are we really pursuing righteousness? The first diagnostic question that I want you to see that Jesus may be asking us to see if we're truly pursuing righteousness is do you hate sin? Not do you dislike sin, not is is sin distasteful to you? No, the question that I think that we have to answer is do we hate sin? Look back at verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and that he were thrown into the sea. 
the millstone that Jesus is talking about here, these millstones were huge. They were so large that they would take these beasts of burden, an oxen or a, or, or a mule or a donkey, and they would turn these millstones. And as they turned the millstone around, it would grind up the grain. They were huge. They were massive. The only exception, which is interesting just to take a note of, is that the Philistines, after Samson had sinned, for their entertainment, they had Samson pushing one of these millstones. Listen to what Jesus says. The Jesus, full of love and grace and mercy, he says this. He says, it's better to have a millstone worn around your neck as a necklace and a cannonball into the sea than it is for one of these little ones to fall away because of your actions, your sin. Listen to that. That's heavy. That's Jesus that says this. That's a warning. It's a warning that makes us ask the question, who in the world are these little ones that Jesus cares about so much? Who are these people that Jesus would say something like this about? If you cause these little ones to fall away, it's this terrible thing. It would be better for you to do this than to do something to cause them to fall away. Do you know who those little ones are? They're you and you and you and you and you and you and me. They're your neighbor, they're your mom, they're your dad, they're your children, they're your classmate, they're your coworker. They are anyone who would humble themselves to follow after Jesus. It's anyone that Jesus is calling to himself. It's anyone who he hopes that we, as followers of Christ, reflect the gospel to through our lives. And Jesus, in his love, says it's better to wear that millstone and to walk into the sea than to make any of us, any of those that he's calling, to walk away from me. If that doesn't make sense to you, I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine Jesus looking through the eyes of a creator God at all of his creation. And he sees those that he created, those that he loves, those that he longs for his praise to come from their mouths, those that he wants to worship him and love him and glorify him. And he sees them. He sees followers of Jesus like you and me. And he sees those people not being directed to heaven, to eternity, to life, but he sees them being directed by followers of Christ, people who claim to be followers of Christ to death and to hell. You see, true love, true love for us demands that Jesus hates those things that would separate us from him. There are consequences to our sin today. And these consequences aren't limited just to our personal lives. That's a reality that we all have to face. The sin that happens in our lives, we don't confine it just to us. The sin that happens in our lives affects all of those little ones who are in our circle. It affects all of those little ones who are watching us, trying to decide if following Jesus is true, if they should do it or not. 1 Corinthians 13, 6 says, love finds no joy in unrighteousness but it rejoices in the truth. You see, Jesus hates sin because he loves righteousness. He rejoices in the truth when we pursue righteousness, when we chase after him. He loves it. He rejoices in our righteousness as we seek him. But Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, he says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The wages of sin is death. And sometimes I often assume from my selfishness that my sin only affects my death. When in fact, my sin affects the death of all those around me. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, Jesus doesn't desire any to perish. He desires all to worship him. 
but to come to repentance is what he desires from them. It's Jesus' desire for none to perish, for all to run to him, for all to know him, to rejoice in him, and that makes him hate sin. And we should hate sin because Jesus hates sin. If you're a follower of Jesus today, how is your attitude toward sin? How is your attitude toward sin affecting not just you, but affecting those that are around you? One commentator said there are at least three ways that you can cause these little ones to fall away. The first way that we can cause a little one to fall away is by purposefully tempting them. Happens a lot, right? We are in our sin, and so what we do is we say, hey, come join me. Come join me in doing this thing that is the opposite of what God wants. We don't want to be alone in our sin, so we purposefully tempt people. We purposefully draw them into our sin. The second thing, the way that we can make these little ones fall is through indirect temptation. We see an example of this in Ephesians 6, verse 4. Parents, I'm sorry for this verse. It's one we like to skip. It says, fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in training and instruction of the Lord. You see, our sin, as we sin against people, can cause people to respond to us in sin. And so indirectly in our sin, we cause people to sin against us because of our sin against them. So we can cause little ones to fall because of direct temptation. We can cause little ones to fall because of indirect temptation. And finally, we can cause little ones to fall because of our bad examples. Romans 14, 13 says, Therefore let none no, excuse me, therefore let none let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or a pitfall in the way of your brother or your sister. You see, the way that we live our lives either affirms or denies whether we believe in sin or not. The way that we live either affirms or denies whether sin is right or not. And those, that, those little ones that are in our circle watch us and they see whether we believe that sin is right, whether it's real or whether it's not. It's our actions that prove what we believe. It's our actions that give them a role model. And people will see by our actions whether we really believe in sin or not. Do you know today that there are people in your life, there are probably people sitting in this church today, in this room, who are anxiously waiting for you not to reflect Christ? They're excited and looking for a reason for you not to reflect Christ so that they can excuse their sin and they cannot believe in Him. And they're watching you. And unfortunately, they don't play fair. You see, people are watching us in the midst of a pandemic and a pastor transition. They're watching us on a rainy day when someone cuts us off. They're watching us when we had to walk through the rain. They're watching us when our kids weren't the greatest angels that we hoped they had been as on the way to church. They're watching our every move. And it's at the moment of weakness that they're waiting for us to fall and not reflect righteousness to them. It might have been this morning when you walked in the pew and you scooted around someone and didn't greet them and they said, oh, look at that hypocrite. It might have been at work when you fudge just a little bit so you could make just a little bit more money. It could have been that someone saw you take that long glance that you shouldn't have taken. It might have been that time that you got worked up and you said or posted something that you shouldn't have said or posted. And those people, they use that reason, those little ones use our actions, you and me, is their excuse to walk away from belief in Jesus. My fear is is today that while Jesus takes sin seriously, you and I may not take it as seriously as we should. We become too comfortable with sin. Maybe there was a time when we hated it, but we've grown a tolerance to it. A tolerance to sin, it doesn't just happen in one big blow. No, it happens little by little. 
It started that time that we didn't want to offend someone by not laughing at the joke, and so we laughed at it. Tolerance to sin came when we watched the show that we weren't supposed to watch. It happened when we liked the post that we weren't supposed to like. It happened when we began to rationalize, well, the world around us just isn't the same world as it was back then. It happened when you didn't want to lose your friend, and so you didn't say anything about that sin that they were committing. And as they continued to commit it, it happened when rather than confront them, you just kind of let them go their way and you separated yourself. It's easier that way. It happened in your own life, in my own life, when we began to excuse our own sin. We thought to ourselves that, well, my sin's not that bad. Not compared to that guy. My sin's not as bad. Oh, well, she, she's really bad. I'm not that bad. We thought that we could keep that sin in the privacy of our home, that we could keep it in a closet, that we could bury it, that no one would ever know. But unfortunately, there's little ones all around us, and they see it. There's bad news about sin. You can never bury it. You can only plan it. You plan it, and sin, unfortunately, always takes root and always bears fruit. And so one day, that fruit comes to light. It comes to light with a pregnancy. It comes to light with an affair comes to light with a DUI, it comes to light with a suicide, and you watch as one of those little ones just walks away. And it's at that moment that you hate sin again. You hate it. You hate it like God hates it, because all of a sudden that fruit of that sin has come in, and it's messed everything up, and that loved one, that little one that you didn't want to walk away is all of a sudden going down a path that you didn't want them ever to go down. And you ask yourself, how did I get here? How did we end up here in this spot? And you remember, I took my eye off the ball. I stopped hating sin. I stopped pursuing righteousness. Jesus calls us to pursue righteousness for the sake of the salvation of others. To hate sin so that it doesn't cause those little ones that we care about, that you care about, to walk away from him. And this leads us to our second question. Question to determine if we're pursuing righteousness or not. Do you love the kingdom? Verses 43 through 48. If your hand causes you to fall away, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to fall away, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. You see, the children's song is true. Be careful, little, one, little hands, what you do. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Be careful, little hands, what you do. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. And it's not limited to these appendages. This warning applies to slandering, hurtful tongues. It applies to gluttonous stomachs. It applies to social media thumbs as well. Jesus isn't calling us to mutilate ourselves. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that sin is so serious. If anything causes you to not pursue him, to not chase after Jesus, it, to cut it off, Nothing is worth more than pursuing him and knowing him and walking in righteousness with him. Whatever it is that keeps you from that, stop it. Pursue Jesus. It's better to be maimed, lame, and with one eye than to continue in your sin. Love the kingdom. Pursue righteousness. 
Any pursuit of sin arrives at the same destination, and that destination is hell. Jesus describes hell as the unquenchable fire where the worm does not die. The original language, that word hell, is derived from a word Gehenna. Gehenna was a, was, is, comes from a word that talks about a city. It was a city in those days that King Josiah hated so much that because they had sacrificed children there. And he never wanted anyone to use that city again because it was so unclean, so unfilthy, so unrighteous. He didn't want anyone to have anything to do with that city. And so he said, let's make it a garbage dump. And let's have fire there so that it burns up all of that garbage. And there'll be worms there that will come up and it will eat that garbage. He, Jesus wants to paint a picture for those disciples that are sitting around with him. That's what your final destination is. Your final destination is that unclean place. The place where the worms and the fire are, the place that last place on earth that you'd ever want to go. That's where sin takes you. Hebrews 10, 26, 27, and 31 say, for if we deliberately go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for your sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. It's a terrifying thing to fall as an unrighteous one into the hands of a righteous God, a God who hates our sin. But don't miss something that's very important. Yes, hell is a real place, unquenchable fire and worms that don't die. That's a place that we don't want to go. But don't miss this. Life can be found in the kingdom of God as we pursue him in righteousness. As we look at this passage, it's easy to be discouraged or sad or distracted by this talk of sin and hell. But look back at verse 45 and 40, 43 and 45. Jesus says, it's better for you to enter life to enter life maimed. It's better for you to enter life lame. The lie of the world today is that life is here. The average American lives 78 years, and the lie that we are told is that the most important thing, what we've got to do is we've got to milk and squeeze out every ounce of life that we can get here because this is where real life is. The reality is, is that true life, according to Jesus, lies just on the other side of this temporal life. 47 says, it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and to be thrown into hell. Jesus says, it's better to walk into the kingdom of God looking like a pirate with a hook of a hand, a peg for a leg and a patch over your eye than it is to go happily dancing into hell. We're led to believe that to really live is to experience all this world has to offer. Live it up, the world says. Belief in sin will only keep us from experiencing life, but that's not true. Life lies in the kingdom of God just after this life. And understanding what the kingdom of God is, loving the kingdom of God, makes laying down these things, laying down sin, laying down our desires and taking up God's will for us, it makes it all worth it. Do you love the kingdom today? Pursue righteousness, pursue it with all of your heart, and at the end of your pursuit will lie the kingdom of God. And that brings us to our third question. Are you being refined? Verses 49 through 50. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt should lose its flavor, how can you season it? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. One of the interesting aspects of the offerings that were presented to the priest in the Old Testament was that the priest would salt those offerings. They would salt those offerings as a reminder of the covenant between God and his people. It's strange, isn't it? You're about to burn up this piece of meat. You're about to burn up this grain. And the priest would salt it right before they burnt it. Leviticus 2.13 gives us an example of this. It says, you're to season each of your grain offerings with salt. 
You must not omit the grain offering, from the grain offering the salt of the covenant of God. You present salt with each of your offerings. The covenant that God made with Abraham was that he would be set apart. He would set apart all of God's people, Abraham's children. He would bless them and keep them and he would make them holy and he would love them, walk with them. He would be their God. And the only requirement that they would have is that he would give them a law, a law that would challenge them to walk in righteousness, to honor him. Why did he want them to walk in righteousness and to honor him? He wanted the whole world to see, everyone to see the righteousness of the children of Israel, the righteousness of the chosen ones, so that they too would know God, that the righteousness of God would shine through his people to a world that didn't know him. So what does it mean to be salted with fire? It says that we're all going to be salted that way. I believe we find the answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. According to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, Paul writes, and another builds on it. But each one's to be careful how he builds on it, for no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. Catch this. That foundation is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, straw, each one will, each one's work will become obvious. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by what? By fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work, if anyone's work that he has built survives, he will have receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. As followers of Jesus, there comes a day when what we do will be laid on the foundation of Christ. Our lives, how we have spent our lives, what we have pursued with our lives will be laid on the foundation of Jesus and a refining fire will come on our lives and we will be found to be, have invested our lives in gold and silver and costly stones or we will be found to have invested our lives in wood and stubble, straw. And when our lives are laid on the foundation of Jesus, The question that we have to ask is, is will we be found to have invested ourselves in the kingdom, that we have loved the kingdom, or will we have been found to have invested our lives in what is left of ash? Romans 12, 1 says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. When your life is laid on that foundation of Jesus, what will be left after you're salted with fire? Sin will rob your life of meaning, of meaningful sacrifice to the Lord. Jesus goes on, he says, salt is good, but if the salt should lose its flavor, how can you season it? Matthew 5, 13 through 16, Jesus does the same teaching. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. As followers of Christ, we're to be different than this world. We're to be salty, but if the salt loses its flavor, you can't salt salt. Why does Jesus say this? Well, the salt that was gathered in Jesus' day was gathered from the Dead Sea. For those chemists in the room, you'll know salt, sodium chloride, is stable. It doesn't lose its, it doesn't lose its saltiness. But this salt that was gathered from the Red Sea was mixed with other mineral, minerals, namely one mineral that was called gypsum. And as the sodium chloride and the gypsum sat together, unrefined, what would happen is that gypsum would just suck all of the salty out of the salt. What would be left would be something, a substance that gave the appearance of salt, but had none of the flavor. 
That's what sin does when left unchecked in our lives. If left alone, it steals our saltiness. We give the appearance of Christ, but we've lost the reflection of Christ in our lives to all those little ones around us. Have salt among yourselves, Jesus says. Be at peace with one another. Isn't that interesting? The implication here for me as we look at this last section is that we aren't to do this refining thing by ourselves. We're not to be lone rangers. We're to refine ourselves in community, in the church, in our church family. We're called to encourage one another in the pursuit of righteousness. We're called to help one another in the pursuit of righteousness. We're called to urge one another on to more and more righteousness. And when needed, we're called to confront one another with love, to hold one another accountable, to challenge one another, not to walk down a path, uh, to walk down a path other than righteousness. Chase after Jesus. That is our goal as a church family. We see this work so beautifully when a brother and another brother and one is in sin and this brother looks at this one and says, brother, please come back. He pleads with him to chase righteousness again and the brother receives it as a blessing and they go together and walk in righteousness, chasing together Jesus. But the problem happens when sin enters the equation and the brother with a plank in his eye gets excited about the brother with a speck in his eye. And the brother in his excitement about the other brother's speck goes to him and beats him over the head with his sin. And then this brother says, well, your sin's bigger than my sin. And there's this back and forth and back and forth and there's no pursuit of righteousness. Jesus says here, have salt among yourselves and, and be at peace with one another. Hold each other accountable, but hold each other accountable in love. Call each other to chase after Jesus. As we, want, as we close today, I wonder if we can have a moment of honesty. Can we have a moment of honesty where we allow this passage to challenge us with a question? Are we pursuing righteousness or not? Do we hate? Do we hate sin? Do we love the kingdom? Are we willing to be a part of a refining process together as brothers and sisters, not to beat each other up, but to push each other more towards Jesus? I'm not foolish enough to believe that there were not someone that walked into this room today who's been wrestling with sin and you can't find victory over it. I'm not foolish enough to know that there's not someone that probably has sin in their pocket even as we sit here. I'm not foolish enough to believe that there's not someone who's waiting right now to get in their car to go home so they can pull their sin out of their closet. Let me plead with you today. Pursue righteousness. It's so much better. It's so much better don't walk out of this place losing to sin anymore. Walk out of this place today loving Jesus so much that that sin just fades away, that the distractions, everything else goes away and you can chase after Jesus.